The Bible contains proof in itself of its divine origin. No other book can answer the questionings of the mind or satisfy the longings of the heart as does the Bible. It is adapted to every age and condition of life and is full of that knowledge which enlightens the mind and sanctifies the soul. In the Bible we have a revelation of the living God. Received by faith, it has power to transform the life. During all its history, a divine watch care has been over it and preserved it for the world. After the flood, as men became numerous and darkness was again settling over the world, holy men wrote as they were moved by the Spirit of God. Thus God spoke to His people and threw them to the world, that a knowledge of God and of His will might not perish from the earth. For centuries, this work went on until Christ, the promised seed, came. With him, the blessed message of light and salvation proclaimed by him and by his apostles, the scripture record closed and the word of God was complete. The Old Testament scriptures were first written in Hebrew upon scrolls or rolls of parchment, linen or papyrus. These were later translated into Greek, the oldest translation being known as the Septuagint or version of the 70, made at Alexandria for the Alexandrian Library by a company of 70 learned Jews under the patronage of Ptolemy Philadelphus about 285 BC. The original order for this translation is said to have been given by Alexander the Great who previously, upon visiting Jerusalem in 332 BC, had learned from the prophecy of Daniel that Grecia was to overthrow the Persian kingdom. See Josephus, Antiquities of the Jews, Book 11, Chapter 8, Paragraph 5. This was the version in common use in the time of Christ. The New Testament was all originally written in Greek except Matthew, which was first written in Hebrew and later translated into Greek. At an early date, Latin translations both of the Septuagint and of the Greek New Testament were made by different individuals. And the more carefully prepared Latin Vulgate of Jerome, the Bible complete, was made 383 through 405 AD. Printing, however, being yet unknown, copies of the Bible could be produced only by the slow, laborious and expensive process of handwriting. This necessarily greatly limited its circulation. Worse still, its illuminating and saving truths were largely hidden for centuries by the errors, superstitions and apostasy of the Dark Ages. During this time, the common people knew little of its contents, but with the invention of the art of printing about the middle of the 15th century and with the dawn of the Great Reformation in the century following, the Bible entered upon a new era, preparatory to the final proclamation of the Gospel throughout the world. Not little significant is the fact that the first book printed from movable type was the Bible in Latin which came from the press of John Gartenberg at Mainz, Germany in 1456, a copy of which in 1911 was sold in New York City for $50,000, the highest price ever paid for a single book. Thus far, however, 
the Bible had been published only in ancient tongues, now little understood by the common people. Without the word of God in their hands, the good seed sown among them was easily destroyed. Oh, said the advocates of its pure teachings, if the people only had the word of God in their own language, this would not happen. Without this, it will be impossible to establish the laity in the truth. And why should they not have it in their own tongue? They reasoned. Moses wrote in the language of the people of his time. The prophet spoke in the tongue familiar to the man whom they addressed. And the New Testament was written in the language then current throughout the Roman world. The translation of the Bible into English by John Wycliffe in 1380 was the chief event in the beginning of the Reformation. It also prepared the way for the revival of Christianity in England and the multiplying there of the word by the millions of all the world that has followed. To make such a translation at that time, says Neander, required a bold spirit which no danger could appeal. For making it, Wycliffe was attacked from various quarters because it was claimed he was introducing among the multitude a book reserved exclusively for the use of the priest. In general denunciation, it was declared that thus was the gospel by him laid more open to the laity and to women who could read than it had formerly been to the most learned of the clergy. And in this way, the gospel pearl is cast abroad and trodden underfoot of swine. In the preface of his translation, Wycliffe exhorted all the people to read the scriptures. A sense of awe and a thrill of joy filled the heart of the great German reformer when, at the age of 20, while examining the volumes in the library of the University of Erfurt, he held in his hands, for the first time in his life, a complete copy of the Bible. Oh God, he murmured, could I but have one of these books, I would ask no other treasure. A little later, he found in a convent a chained book. To this he had constant recourse. But all these Bibles here are elsewhere save in England, were in an ancient tongue and could be read only by the educated. Why, thought Luther, should the living word be confined to dead languages? Like Wycliffe, therefore he resolved to give his countrymen the Bible in their own language. This he did, the New Testament in 1522, and the Bible complete the crowning work of his life in 1534. Impressed with the idea that the people should read the scriptures in their mother tongue, William Tyndale, likewise in 1525, gave to the English his translation of the New Testament and later of portions of the Old Testament scriptures. His ardent desire that they should know the Bible was well expressed in the statement that if God spared his life, it would cause the boy that drives the plow to know more of the scriptures than was commonly known by the divines of his day. The first complete printed English Bible was that of Miles Coverdell, printed at Zurich, Switzerland in 1535. Matthew's Bible, Taverner's Bible, and the Great Bible prepared at the suggestion of Thomas Cromwell, Earl of Essex, appeared soon after. Thus the light of truth began to shine forth once more, but not without opposition. As Jehoiakim, king of Judah, the princes under King Hezekiah showed their contempt for God by burning the writings of Jeremiah and confining the prophet in a dungeon. Jeremiah 36, 20 through 23 and Jeremiah 38, 1 through 6. So now men sought to stem the rising tide of reform by burning the Bible and its translators. Bible burning was inaugurated in England by the destruction of copies 
of the Antwerp edition of Tyndale's New Testament at St. Paul's Cross, London, in 1527, following by the burning of a second edition in 1530. A little later, there were wholesale burnings of the writings and translations of Wycliffe, Tyndale, Basil, Barnes, Coverdale, and others. 43 years after the death of Wycliffe, or in 1428 AD, by order of the Council of Constance, his bones were dug up and burned. October 6, 1536, by order of Charles V of Germany, Tyndale was strangled and burned at the stake at Vilvord, near Brussels. If Luther will not retract, wrote Henry VIII of England, let himself and his writings be committed to the flames. Such under the spiritual tyranny that ruled in those times was the fate of many who stood for God and his word. But the word of God could not be forever bound. In attempting to prevent its circulation, men soon discovered that they were undertaking a work beyond their strength. The Bible had taken deep root in the hearts of the people. What kings and prelates had sought to suppress and destroy, kings and prelates now began to foster and supply. In his stories from English history, pages 196, through 197, Henry P. Warren says, Henry, by Cromwell's advice, ordered a translation of the Bible to be made in English and a copy to be placed in every church. There had been English translations before, but they had not been in the hands of the people generally and had only been read secretly and in fear. Cromwell then appointed Cramner and the bishops to revise the Bible and publish it without note or comment. And in the year 1539, a copy of the English Bible was changed to the reading desk of every parish church. From that time, the Bible was never ceased to be printed and sold freely, says Charles C. Coffin in his Stories of Liberty, page 44. The people listened to the reading with wonder and delight. They begin to think, and when men begin to think, they take a step toward freedom. They see that the Bible gives them rights which hitherto have been denied them. The right to read, to acquire knowledge. Schools are started. Men and women who till now have not known a letter of the alphabet learn to read. Children teach their parents. It is the beginning of a new life, a new order of things in the community, the beginning of liberty. Finally, great Bible societies were organized in England, America, and many of the countries of Europe for the purpose of giving the Bible to the world, to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people in its own language. Since its organization in 1804, the British and Foreign Bible Society up to 1912 had published the scriptures or portions of them in 440 languages and dialects, with a total of 53,274,000 516 entire Bibles, 84,059,610 New Testaments, and 89,816,644 portions of the Bible, or a grand total of 227,150,770 copies. The total issue of the American Bible Society in the first 96 years following its organization, or from 1816 to 1912, amounts to 96,219,105 copies. It now publishes the Bible in over 100 languages. These 
while the largest of their kind are but two of the 27 Bible societies now disseminating the scriptures. Thus is the world being provided with the word of God, preparatory to the giving of the closing gospel message to all mankind, the ending of the reign of sin and the advent of the Lord in glory. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Matthew 24, 14. The Bible is a great textbook for man. It is his lamp to our feet and a light to our path in this world of sin. The value of Bible study cannot therefore be overestimated. Considered from a literary standpoint alone, the Bible stands preeminent. Its terse, chaste style and impressive imagery, its interesting stories and well-told narratives, its deep wisdom and its sound logic, its dignified language and its elevated themes all make it worthy of universal reading and careful study. As an educating power, the Bible has no equal. Nothing so broadens the vision, strengthens the mind, elevates the thoughts, and ennobles the affections as does the study of the sublime and stupendous truths of revelation. A knowledge of its principles is an essential preparation to every calling. To the extent that it is studied and its teachings are received, it gives strength of character, noble ambition, keenness of perception, and sound judgment. Of all the books ever written, none contains lessons so instructive, precepts so pure, or promises so great as the Bible. There is nothing that so convinces the mind of the inspiration of the Bible as does the reading of the Bible itself, and especially those portions known as the prophecies. After the resurrection of Christ, when everything else seemed to have failed to convince the disciples that he had risen from the dead, he appealed to the inspired word and expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning him. Luke 24, 25 through 27. And they believed. On another occasion he said, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Luke 16, 31. As a guide, the Bible is without a rival. It gives a calm peace in believing and a firm hope of the future. It solves the great problem of the life and destiny and inspires to a life of purity, patience, and well-doing. It fills the heart with love of God and a desire to do good to others and thus prepares for usefulness here and for a home in heaven. It teaches the value of the soul by revealing the price that has been paid to redeem it. It makes known the only antidote for sin and presents the only perfect code of morals ever given. It tells of the future and the preparation necessary to meet it. It makes us bold for the right and sustains the soul in adversity and affliction. It lights up the dark valley of death and points to a life unending. It leads to God and to Christ, whom to know is life eternal. In short, it is the one book to live by and die by. As the king of Israel was instructed to write him a copy of the law and to read therein all the days of his life, that he might fear the Lord, keep his word, and thus prolong his days and the days of his children. Deuteronomy 17, 18 through 20. So ought men now to study the Bible and from it learn that fear which is the beginning of wisdom and that knowledge which is unto salvation.
Thank you very much for watching. I hope you've been blessed by this documentary type video about the Bible. I've been working on this project for more than four or five months and I'm excited to hear what you all think about it. I appreciate your all support and a special thank you to Magdalene for donating toward this project. God bless you. I appreciate you so much. If you'd like to support this channel, please pray for this ministry. You can also donate on my PayPal. Links down below in the description box. Subscribe, like and share so that we can reach more people. Again, thank you to my subscribers and followers on all my social media platforms. My name is Tanaka and this is Lightbearers Studio.